In this video, we're going to go over everything I've learned selling catch-all trades over the past few years from different hold-down methods, pricing, keeping them flat, and everything else I could think of. So when making catch-all trays, what kind of wood should you use? And in my opinion, you should use a nice hardwood. My most common woods I use are just domestic hardwoods, and for me that is just walnut, cherry, and maple. Them are a majority of the woods I use because they're easy to get locally and they're nice, hard, stable woods. You could go ahead and use something like pine or like cedar, but I would just not quite recommend that just because the wood is so soft and it's really easy to dent and it's more likely to warp as it's not so dense. But another major problem people have with catch-all trays is you're removing a bunch of surface area from one side and odds are in the next day or two that board is going to warp. So how do you combat that? You combat that by gluing it together in a bunch of little strips. If it's the same type of wood, even better. Or I take like two large pieces of scrap like this and I'll glue them together in opposing ring directions. Also, if you make them super thin, the odds of it warping are a lot higher. So generally I like to make mine between three quarters and one inch. I don't mess with a ton of thick stock just because I don't generally have two inch plus thick stock on hand. It's generally like this and this comes about 0.9 inches thick just from my lumber mill. I would also, this is my opinion, I generally avoid very dense exotic woods. I, I avoid bloodwood, purple heart, and wenge. All that stuff's great, but it's super expensive and super dense and very rough on your machine and your bits. It does work fine in this beautiful wood. It's just not something I really mess with. Um, they do look good in cutting boards and all that, but again, it's just not for me. So I'm not going to go too deep into milling. Hopefully you guys understand like the basics of milling and getting your lumber flat. Um, if not, I'm sure there's a bunch of different videos out there. So I cut them into a bunch of two inch strips and now I'm going to plane them down and get them nice and even for a glue up. And as I said earlier, I don't have a bunch of thick wood. So this is one way to achieve thicker wood. You just cut them into as thick a pieces as you want. And being a bunch of individual pieces like this, it'll be pretty stable and not very likely to warp which is why people make thicker cutting boards in edge grain orientation. And here's that wider chunk of wood from before, and it's just best practice to cut it into two to three chunks. If it's over eight inches, it's just better in multiple pieces. It's gonna be more stable, less likely to warp, and once it's oiled and sanded, you're really never gonna know. Just make sure you glue it together in the alternating grain, otherwise it just defeats the purpose. Then here's another example, just be cautious of the grain orientation. I typically use type on two and three. I leave them in the clamp for about an hour and then I glue up the next batch. So we just glued together a bunch of scraps. Now we're gonna trim off the excess, run them through the planer to get them all nice and even. So now we have a bunch of material. How do we hold it down and what are the best ways that I've found? So the methods I use the most for stuff like this is double-sided tape. I prefer masking tape and CA glue over double-sided tape. It's just a little cheaper to run it this way and it's not as thick and it doesn't gum up your bits as bad from my experience. But double-sided tape is just fine. And the next would be screws. I just drill a hole in each corner so it doesn't split the board. And then I just put these directly in each corner, holding it down to the workpiece. And most of the time, two screws are plenty. The only downside is, is it leaves these little mounds when you take the screw out of the MDF. But a little tiny scraper of any sort takes them right off super fast and easy. So if I was going to batch out a ton of these and they were all relatively the same size, what I would do is create some sort of fence system so you don't got to worry about any kind of consumables like this. So this is how I do all my cutting boards. I put it in the corner. I have a T-track here and then I just simply tighten this down and that holds it in just fine with the pressure. That's how I do all my inlay cutting boards. So if I was going to specifically do these, I would just make a more condensed version of this. So if you're looking for production and crank out a bunch of these, it's not that cost effective or time effective to have a bunch of small little trays. So what I would do in that situation where I'm trying to make a bunch of the same item essentially, is I would just glue up a big panel and put a screw in each corner and then just run tabs. So the, the advantage of something like this for one-offs is you don't got to run tabs at all just because that double-sided tape will just hold that in place. So for this situation, I'm simply just going to use the poor man's double-sided tape as I call it and then we're just going to run these trays. 
So when I'm setting my zero for stuff like this, I like to always set my zero from the center. I don't use a probe or anything. That's just my personal preference. So I just take a straight edge like this. And there's my center. So I like to set my X and Y to the center of the board. And then for stuff like this, where I'm cutting out a bunch of pieces, I'll set my zero, my Z zero from the waste board and not the top of the piece. Cause then if all these thicknesses are off a tiny little bit, it's not really gonna matter. and It'll cut down to the same depth every time. And one of the major points to the double sided tape is you need to make sure your piece is flat. If it's warped and wobbling, the double sided tape's just not gonna stick. You don't need activator or anything. If people that tell you you do, don't know. You can use it, but this hardens up like instantly. Little bead. I like to slide it around just to spread that glue out a little bit. And just like that, it's stuck down and ready to go. Another thing to be aware of when you're making trays like this is the grain direction. So if you're gonna do a long tray, you want the grain direction to go with the longest direction of the board. So we're gonna get started on this basic round tray. This is a three quarter inch bull bit. So our bull's cut out and you can see we have all these little rings. These are just like step over lines. The average step over is 40%. That's typically what's stock in your software. And you can lower that to make these rings a lot closer, leaving almost a flawless finish. This works with bull bits and other three quarter straight bits, anything you're looking for a cleaner finish. And before it was a 40% step over and this is a 10% step over. You can see how much cleaner the surface is. You're still gonna have to sand it a little bit, but it's way easier to sand. And then we're gonna finish it up with a quarter inch down cut. And you can see setting your zero from the waste board and not the top of the board leaves it super close every time. I'm not sure if you can do that in the lower end softwares, but you can for sure in Vetric. You can see just how much smoother that is with that quick final cleanup pass. So here's our basic circle. This is Vetric software, but any software should be able to do this stuff. These are pretty basic settings. So select our inner ring, create a pocket tool path. And then I like to go 0.4 deep. We're using a three quarter inch bull bit. And then I ramp that in as it's a pretty large bit. And then to do the cleanup pass, you're gonna select the inner ring again, do the pocket tool path, and then edit the bit. And then you're gonna set the step over which tells it how much to take in each pass to about 10%. You can play with this number. The lower the number, the cleaner it's gonna be, but the longer it's gonna take. And then since we're only taking a tiny amount of material, you can go pretty fast here. And then you're gonna set your start depth to 0.4. So it already accounts for all the material that's already been removed. And then I do a cut depth of 0.02 or whatever tiny amount you choose with the same exact bowl bit. And then I play with this pocket allowance to ensure that it stays inside this line. I don't know if it's because of the step over or what, but if you don't adjust it, it cuts past this line. And then these are the same exact bit, so you can just group these and they'll run consecutively. So let's preview. And there you can see it does the cleanup tool path. You can go pretty fast here as you're only removing a tiny amount of material. Okay, so now we're gonna show you the basics on how to make these different shape trays. And again, this is all basic stuff. I used easel for a while and they had the same exact features. It just looks a little different. So I got this shade of the Wisconsin State just online. It was some free vector somewhere. We're gonna select that vector. Go over here to offset. I like to do a 0.4 inch offset, then outwards. And there we go. It's literally that easy. But I like to come in here and clean up the file as you don't want any of these super sharp points. I just don't think it looks good and it's a lot harder to get in here and like sand that kind of stuff. Versus if this is a clean transition here, it's just quick and easy to sand versus trying to hand sand all them little corners. So there's a few ways to do it. You can do it over here with this fillet tool. I set it to like 0.3, let's just do 0.4 normal fill it then you just simply click it and that cleans it up Oop. and then find all the sharp points I can
And there we go. A nice clean outer line and it's ready to carve. Pocket tool path, cut outside line tool path with like a quarter inch down cut. And now we're going to show you how to use Aura Mask and to get a nice clean little custom paint job. First I use a piece of masking tape just to get any dust and whatever I can off of there to ensure it sticks well. And then I just use a little piece of it. I'll link to this in the description. It's just like a painting mask. And then use some sort of scraper to flatten it out and get it to adhere pretty well. And this is a 90 degree V-bit. I'm not a huge fan of using 60 degree or less as they just take forever. And we'll hand it off to Jess as she does all the detail work. So first we cleaned it off with one of these wire brushes just to get rid of all the little fuzzies. And then I like to use this Rust-Oleum clear chalked. Otherwise you can also use a clear water-based poly. We are using the clear right now to seal off the edges and this will prevent it from bleeding when we put the color on later on. Another way you can do this is if the base is painted of what you're doing. Say this board is white. I can paint this white and that will seal the edges off with the color of the board so it won't matter then what I paint over the top and it won't bleed. So another way that you can add color aside from painting it on by hand is to spray paint it. You're going to have to mask off the entire area so you don't get any overspray on your piece but make sure you still do clear. You can do a clear coat like this, poly, or with spray paint, um, but you're going to have to be really fast because the spray paint melts the Aura Mask. So you're going to need to spray it with clear, let it dry for a second, and then spray it with whatever color you're using. Another option for customization is a laser. We have this really big CO2 laser and it offers a lot of options for customization. Or a lot of CNC's offer diode lasers that you can attach to where your spindle would be. So the advantages for using a laser is that you can get a lot more detail into your design. But this is going to take a lot more time versus engraving on a CNC, they're pretty quick. You can do relatively big designs in under 30 minutes. We're going to laser a sunflower onto this tray. It's going to be roughly the size of the tray, but it's still going to take 30 minutes just to laser it. And this is a three quarter inch straight bit. It does a great job at removing material and leaving a pretty clean bottom. And I didn't center my piece in the software. We'll I'll show you how to fix that. So when stuff like this happens, I typically try to save it. So we'll just use a piece of this off cut here to try to match this up the best we can so it's not a complete waste. And then instead of this whole piece just going to waste, I'll just glue this on the end. It's a lot cleaner and less visible if it's on the edge versus the end but at least it won't be a complete loss. I'll just sell it for a little less. Once you sand it and add finish, it'll hardly be noticeable. And you can see it on the right edge. It is a little noticeable, but the average person will probably never even notice. Again, I would sell it at a discount. And ideally, you add clear coat before you add the epoxy so it doesn't bleed, but usually it sands out. And then a simple way to make stuff stand out versus others is just adding a simple texture. There's a texture tool pass section in Vetric, and you can do a ton of different patterns and shapes with this kind of stuff, but it just makes the basic tray look a lot cooler. I also don't see people using this bit very often, but it's a roundover bit. It's like a form tool, and it does the roundover bit on the tray for you, so you don't got to do it by hand. It works pretty slick and goes pretty fast. I just ran it with the stock recommended settings and I got a little bit of tear out, so I'll just have to slow it down and kind of use it a little more to get used to it. Then if I feel the tray needs it, a 3 8 round over on the bottom always looks nice. Okay, so what bits do we need to make pretty much any catch-all tray? So for the most part, you're gonna need something to cut out the trays, which a quarter inch down cut is plenty. And then there's bits to remove a bunch of material at a fast rate, because it would take forever with a bit like this. Two bits are the same exact size. The only difference is this one is radius. So if you want that radius look, kind of like in there as well, or you want that straight cut clean look like these, 
That's the only difference between these two. This is a Freud bit. Don't even know what brand bit this is. And then there's also these specialty bits like this. I'll tag all these into the description, but you saw me using this earlier. I still gotta like hone it in a little bit, but you can see it has that nice little round over. And then there's so many companies out there that make great bits. I mostly use Whiteside and Amana, but there are tons of companies out there that are making awesome bits. As long as you're not buying the cheapest bits possible, you will be okay. Another major difference between these two is the finish quality. You can see, I mean, I did the surfacing pass to clean all this up, but with this bit, you don't have to do that small step over pass. Like look how clean these are. And I didn't even sand them or anything. Versus this, even with the cleanup pass, you can still see a little bit of lines, which will sand out easy. But again, it's just more work to get this to cut smooth than it is something like this up or straight cut bit. All right, sanding, everyone's favorite task. What is the quickest way to sand these and how do I go about it? So first off, we'll talk about pricing and all that in a little bit, but the way I view these catch-all trays is these are just a quick bang out item. You're gonna get 30 to $100 probably on average for these types of catch-all trays. So you just can't spend a ton of time sanding this. If you're spending an hour sanding each catch-all tray, you lost money. So you need to sand it as fast as you can and as well as you can. And then I start with 150 and I go up to 220, that is plenty. And then for the instruments I like to use, I like this oscillating sander with this triangle head. It doesn't have to be this, I just like this small triangle head. It just gets in all these little nooks and crannies really well. And then I like to make the trays larger so that I can just use a standard five inch orbital. So I can get as much as I can with this and then just clean up with this. Someone also recommended this uh, drill attachment. It's like a little puck that holds sandpaper on it. They said the attachment's great, but the sandpaper sucks. So you can just use these little rings as a template to cut your own. Same with this, the stock sandpaper is just not good. So just use your older pieces and just cut a little you know, triangle out of that. And then remember earlier, we rounded all these points so there's no sharp corners. Again, it just makes it so much easier to get that sander in there versus this, if this was just a tight point in there, it's just so hard to sand that. And then for these edges, I don't spend a ton of time here. I just go around and give it a quick, you know, with like 180 and I just kind of hand sand it just to smooth it out. It, it's not that, I've never had anyone complain. If you're sitting here polishing this, you're just gonna, it's just gonna take forever. I try to sand these as fast as possible. I sand as much as I can with the big sander, clean up with the smaller sander, and then I just kind of break all the edges slightly and sand the outside so there's no chatter marks or cut marks. I've sanded a ton of these, so I can do each tray in about five to 10 minutes. So this little sander thing's all right. I prefer the oscillating head sanders. It just works a little cleaner, and this thing kind of just flings dust everywhere but it's like $9 and it does get in the spots nice and easy. And unlike this epoxy with like 80 grit on there, it knocked it down pretty quickly. You also have to be pretty careful with something like this as it's quite easy to make little tiny low spots and it'd probably work a lot better if I had like a handle on this drill. Also, you're gonna have to hand sand these. There's just really no way around it. You're gonna be some hand sanding, but little tools like this, I'll link all this stuff in the description, are great. This little gator zip thing, just works great for getting down in corners and crannies and all that kind of stuff. Let's move on to finishing. Finishes, what's the best ones to use for catch-all trays and such? These are like my go-tos. I love Walrus Oil, they make great products. Um, we'll start out with the cutting board oil, just plain natural oil. So it works great, but it loses its luster quite fast. Um, so I, on these, I don't really use this. It's fine though. And then I used to use a lot of furniture finish. It's just a bunch of natural oils. Uh, sunflower oil, tongue oil, hemp oil, lime oil, a uh, great option. I've just been using a ton of tongue oil. It, this has just been my go-to. It, it just holds its luster really well, gives it beautiful color. It's food safe, protects it against stains, and that's all I need for something like this. I put this on kitchen utensils, and pretty much every small item I make, from utensils, catch-all trays, all the other little projects you see me make, it's usually tongue oil on there. So that's my go-to. And then there's other finishes like this, these hard wax oils, uh, Rubio, Monocoat, Osmo, General Finishes has one. For the most part, they're all relatively the same. They all have their own little quirks, but this works great. It's just very expensive versus this thing of tongue oil will last way longer than this. And it's just a little harder to apply. I like Osmo. I put it on a lot of my other bigger builds that are a higher dollar price point. Again, for me, 
as fast and easy as possible with these cheaper small items. And for me, the tongue oil is perfect. And then you could go ahead and spray a finish on these. Again, the time thing, it's a $30 to $100 product. I'm not trying to spend half the time just spraying a finish on here and standing between coats. But it does look very nice if you do that. And then for application, this is why I like these kind of finishes. You literally just slop it on there and I let it sit for about 12 hours and then the next day I wipe off all the excess and just let it dry for a few hours and they're usually good to go. It's that easy. So pricing and what typically sells best from my experience. So a basic pricing model for people just starting out to give you a rough idea of what you should charge. We'll just say $1 a minute CNC time and then $40 to $60 an hour for your like work time. So this took about 12 minutes of carve time on the CNC. So we'll just round up and say it took 15 minutes to carve. We're at $15. And then say you charge $60 an hour for your work hours, then we're at $45. So if you can't get at least $45 for this, it's just not worth your time to make. And I would look for a different item to sell. Stuff like this is super easy to batch out. So you can probably get the finishing and sanding and all that down pretty quick if you're doing a large batch of them. So what sells the best? In my experience, we used to sell a ton of these custom dog trays. People love their dogs, they love their kids. So if you can revolve your products around something like that, people will eat it up. So we used to sell these between $40 to $80. And then I would charge $40 to draw a custom dog face file and they would send me a picture. Most people didn't go that route just because I had a wide variety of different dog breeds and it was generally close enough. So. 40 to $80 and I could batch, batch out a bunch of these. I do not sell catch-all trays anymore as I've found other items that just sell better with higher price tags. Again, because it's just a small item, it's hard to get a bunch of money for it. We do offer a bunch of different SVG files on our website of different dog faces. All of ours are tried and true. They all engrave well. Some stuff just doesn't engrave well if it has super thin lines. So I try to make the lines a little beefier so they can be engraved fast with a 90 degree V-bit. People love their home state. Home states and like lakes. People that have lake houses love their lake and buy all kinds of stuff in the shape of the lake they live on and stuff like that. It's super easy to make those files and you can crank out a bunch of them. And then home states with you know whatever they want to put in there, the family name or just home or the state name. People love that kind of stuff. And then stuff that revolves around hobbies. Just basic catch-all trays just don't sell that well. I've sold a decent bit of them for like the EDC kind of trays, but Everyone makes those, people aren't very creative, so you need to be creative and upsell a product. So hobbies, people love guitars, golf, football, all stuff like that. So if you can find a good niche that revolves people's hobbies, it will sell, I promise. And then if you wanna go for more clean, sleek trays, I just like the nice clean roundovers, add a nice little texture in the bottom, and it just sticks out from everyone else. Again, basic boring trays just aren't gonna sell that well. And people sell those for pennies. It's just hard to compete with that basic market. And then obviously you can do the customizations as we showed before. I prefer the paint and the laser technique if you're gonna add something to the bottom. I never really messed with the epoxy. It just wasn't worth the time in my opinion because I could make two to three of these in the time it takes you to fill and sand all this epoxy. If you, if you can get what it's worth by all means, good for you, that's great. But from my experience, it's just more messing around than it's really worth. And then another thing that sells super well are these like food holder charcuterie board type things. People love their food. They love to display food at like family gatherings and football games and stuff like that. So something like this, it took an hour to carve in the CNC. So we'll say $60. And then it took about 30, 40 minutes to finish it. So we'll just say, if you can't get at least $100 for this, it's just not worth your time with the, all the hand sanding and stuff like that. So these are great, but you need to be able to get what you're worth. Because if you can sell three of these to one of these, you're gonna make more money batching out these little simple trays than in here sanding all these little nooks and crannies. But again, people love stuff they can display food on. You could put vegetables in here. I have a bunch of different designs on the website for different stuff to hold, you know, food, candy, all kinds of stuff. So I would say custom dog family type trays sell the best. And then second, home state, stuff like that. And then hobbies, it's gotta be custom. And then these, it's just, the issue with these is getting what they're worth. You have to be able to sell them at a higher price point and some people struggle with that. I could go on and on about pricing. I, maybe we'll do a Patreon video on that, but 
This is the end of the video. I hope you guys learned something. It's geared a little bit more towards the beginner, but catch-all trays are a great thing to make and sell. They don't require much wood, and once you have the design made, you can really batch these things out. We do have a Patreon live now. You can join our Patreon. We're going to start doing live streams over there and just talk about whatever you guys want. And we're also going to offer a bunch of steep discounts on all of our different files that we offer. So check that out. We appreciate it. If you just want to support us, subscribe to the channel, buy our files, join Patreon, anything like that helps out a ton. Even just leaving a comment, we appreciate all of you. So hope you all have a wonderful day.